Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session, Generative AI, A Future Unimagined. I am Kanch, an AI enthusiast, and for the past few months, living and breathing generative AI. I've been in the industry for about 20 years. We started off as a developer in mainframe, but then pivoted to a performance architect with DB2, then within cloud, big data, and AI for the past three years. Generative AI is a topic I've been very interested in. This is one stream in AI other than researchers. Uh, no one can or should call themselves as experts yet. Future unimagined is for all of us to see the potential from self-driving cars to chatbots and machine learning algorithms. AI is already reshaping our world, promising to continue to do so in future with this disruptive technology. Um, as you could see here, I can be reached via LinkedIn or my email account at cloudraise.info, cloudraise my blog and my website, cloudraise.info. Let's just jump right in. Today's agenda, generative AI is the talk of the town. In this session, we'll cover what that means, how this will impact enterprises, and some of the buzzwords you will hear, and how you can get to know more. Most of these are basic concepts and hopefully it doesn't change, but I would like to add a caveat that this technology is fast developing. The content is good today, only as of today. <laughs> I'm looking forward to sharing my learnings um, in the next hour. Happy to field any questions uh, during the session. I have three sections or connect with the, any of you one-on-one -on -one if needed. Let's jump right in. So let's look at the word cloud right now it looks like some of you have responded and i see a lot of uh, job killer scary super cool stupid um futuristic transformative uh, there has been a, there are a lot of words in here and i would like to see how you change your opinion, or if you do change your opinion after the session. Um, surprising creativity. Uh, um, Dali keeps coming, stable diffusion keeps coming. So I, I probably won't be covering uh, some of these, but I'm, I'm very excited to see um, the way everyone is thinking towards the technology. And I think we all should, in some regards, think of it that way. So let's jump into our slides and see how it's going to take us. When you look at this picture, what resonates with you? You can throw them in the chat if you if you feel like you'd like to know what what does it mean in this this is a picture and it looks like can anyone guess what this is, what this picture is? And then we can go a little bit library. Yeah, it's a library. So um, at, even today, we do still go to library. Um, but um, there are archives library admins. I don't know where this is from, unfortunately. But it is a library. That is clear. But in 1998, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, two computer science PhD students at Stanford University, uh, they believed that internet was growing too big, uh, and they want to just like it cannot be searched manually. It will be very useful to automate this, and the prioritizing of search results became of importance. The time Google was launched, there was ten search engines in the market, each with its um, each with its unique set of differentiators. Google somewhat kind of enabled the way World Wide Web could be used for research purposes. Most of us who are old enough today um, can recall the days going to library, getting the research information, versus with search through internet, we are able to have the world at our fingertips. Would, would any of you disagree the life before internet, I wouldn't say Google, the internet, and the life after Google, the way we approach it for research has changed and evolved. Okay, 
Let's jump into this one. What are you saying? What is the obvious? What are the obvious things here? You see. I would like to time. Yeah, I see the um, railway station with the time lines. Yes, subway train station, different times. Yes, that is true. There's a lot of crowd. Okay, now we are getting there. Ahmed, you are in the right thinking. Online booking, people are waiting. Yes, yes. Ticket purchase. Yes. Okay. Let's jump into the next slide. Tell me what's obvious here. What's different with this one, which did not have, which was not there before? Bingo. Bravo. Yes. Mobile phones. Mobile adoption, particularly smartphones, came into picture what 2008. Many organizations changed to a mobile first strategy over the next decade. Today, half of the web traffic we have around the world comes from mobile. Let's predict it would be 70% by the end of 2025. This shows how fast things moved. Let's see. We saw how internet and mobile adoption took a while for the masses to adopt. We saw mobile had a decade for it to be 50% uh, of that traffic. But if there is one app who, which reached 100 million on the first day, is ChatGPT. In digital world, mass adoption still is hard. Like I can see, Twitter and Facebook there took three years, five years. Uh, Pokemon Go, I heard, took 19 days to get to 50 million. What makes ChatGPT unique? If if you are an IT or if you are, if you are if you are here today. You might have already played around with ChatGPT to some degree. Maybe you asked for a recipe. Maybe you researched a topic. Maybe you planned a vacation. Or um, there is a right, maybe you wrote an email. There is a lot of hype. We need to first figure out if this is real because we are all spending time learning this. So we need to understand if this is real. Let's go to the market research. The market research says that the current market for generative AI is 13 billion, with the projected growth to 120 billion in this decade. Just this year, in the past four, first four months, we are in fifth month, first four, four months, the sales related to Gen AI app is up by 14, 1,480%. Revenue for these apps are more than 1,000%. The forecast and current trend is accelerated with the numerous VCs identifying use cases. The roadmap accelerated by this technology. The career defining moment is real, and I'm glad you took the I'm today in joining the call, and I hope the following conversation takes you to dig deep further. So this is the market. I'm going to jump into generative AI. Prior to generative AI, we have most often used a variation of one second. Turn the pointer. Um, I most often use this um, slide to highlight what is in artificial intelligence, what is machine learning, and how all of this comes together. As you could see, there are several branches to artificial intelligence. One of which is machine learning, we all know. When you talk about machine learning, there has been an evol evolution of how it interprets the data and produces the prediction inference. All of the fields in this diagram are continuous research areas. You do want to highlight, you do see natural language generation, um, voice synthesis, deep learning, all of this were part of artificial intelligence before, 
But there was a new word which was coined called generative AI in 2014 by Ian Goodfellow on his paper, Generative Adversarial Networks. Since then, most of those concepts from the artificial intelligence moved to this area of generative AI. With the recent type of chat GPT, you have seen how the text can revolutionize your thinking, optimize your workload in some regards. The field of generative AI is much more than natural language, much more than you know, chat GPT asking your recipe or researching something. You might you have seen this in text to picture, you have seen that in picture to text, video to text, video synthesizing. The world of this is unimagined in many regards, yet we are starting to see a clear differentiator. Let's step into text. Human communicate, humans communicate through language. Until recently, the conventional wisdom was that while AI was better than humans, data-driven decision-making tasks it was sorry. It was still inferior to humans for cognitive and creative ones. But in the past year, language-based AI has advanced by leaps and bounds, changing the common notions of what this technology can do. If you are in IT, you probably have heard of code generation. You probably have heard of code generation, which by itself, uh, the next generation set of co tools for code generation will be leading to more productive programmers, programming skills being increased for complex number of tasks. This may not be true for all software developments, but it can create a significant impact to web development and data processing. In a nutshell, Let's see what generative AI is. Spend some time here. Generative AI has the ability to create content based on the model it's trained on. There are a couple of things to note here. What is the data? What is the algorithm? What is the output? How do you access them? For any kind of model, these are the questions we ask. So let's start with what the data is. The data for these, uh, for particularly for text, these are called large language models or LLMs. These LLMs are large, use a large corpus of data from across the internet, social media, community forums, Stack Overflow, Quora, anything available to public. And these algorithms algorithms are trained. So first let's figure out what is this what is this algorithm? First let's figure out currently what algorithm we know of. Initially if you talked about traditional programming, um, which we are used to, like you know, say if you, you have used C, Java, um, they you press precisely tell the sequence of actions to get from what is the input and what is the output. You, you define what that is. In, the, in neural networks, you actually show them what these are. So example, if you have a pile of animal pictures, you tell them that, okay, this is cat, this is a dog, this is a sheep. And with the amount of data it has, the next time it sees a cat picture, it recognizes it. And this is a single task model. It is thought to train a specific problem. But you show the data on how it is to be trained. Whereas in generative AI, it's a new paradigm. The models are multi-task ones, trained via ingestion of large corpuses of data. This like, you know, you give a whole encyclopedia to a child and ask them a variety of questions across domains. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to train them on the subject matter. 
they said they read the book and then they can answer whatever questions you might have. Now, I want to do one slide before I go to questions. Let's start with how this natural language, uh, particularly the LLM model, is thinks of itself. Imagine I'm asking you to write a story. And if I have to ask you now, you probably will think, hey, who are the players? Who do you want the story to be? Who the audience will be? And maybe how am I going to write this? But if I ask the same to an LLM, you go and ask, write a story. It's not writing. It doesn't have any context. You may did write and say, in this case, we decided to play is the first couple of words. Every word is a prediction of what the word is based on what it has seen before. It doesn't think like you or me or any other context other than, if, other than if you tell them what the context is. Let's see how this evolves. So in this case, it's dividing between game, in, ball. It takes the highest probability of the word and then it adds on, we decided to play game of chess in the rain ball. So each of those words are determined by the probability of what it thinks it is. As you can see, for me, LLM is a fancy autocomplete. In many regards, rather than the ability to think through, but the probability of uttering the next word with much accuracy higher than you or me, based on the, what the data it has seen. With this in mind, which is the ideal use cases I've seen are in narration, summarization, or personalization. There are two words here I want you to remember, which is probabilistic and deterministic. Models are probabilistic. It's going to figure out what's the highest probability for the next word being the word. Most of our rest of the neural network models, you know, are all deterministic in nature because it has a clear set of, if I see these kind of inputs, this is the kind of output I will generate. So now that we have understood what is generative AI, I covered what is generative AI, what is the LLM, Let's see if there are questions before I jump into building blocks. What's the difference between LLM and MLM? So LLM is large language model, which is essentially what we are going to be discussing today. With LLMs have have a unique perspective in the sense that it goes against multiple uh, set of data. And that it creates what it thinks would be the answer. And MLM is masked language models, which predicts the missing words in a sentence based on the context provided by the surrounding words. So if I had to, um, like a fill in the blank, <laughs> I would say. So it is. it determines what that word could be based on the scenario it is. So both of them are language models, but it just, the context is a little bit different. Does it sound good, Ali? Okay. So, is there any other question I can answer? Uh, if, can I mark this as answered? Okay. Okay. So is there any other question before we jump into the next thing? Compression on LLMs, would MLM be useful for the loss of accuracy? I unfortunately don't have much information with respect to MLM on how it is uh, done, um, but 
that that's a quest that's a good question which I can take off. Maybe connect with me in LinkedIn and I can find some answer for you, Zane. Okay. Is there anything else before I jump to the building blocks? So let's start with like you know, we have uh, come to we have come to the point of understanding what the, what a generative AI is. What are the what are the components to it? Let's do the building blocks of it. In a pre AI generative AI, a life of a model can be in this space. Again, this is not complete. Um, this needs like there are several more con um, concepts in the enterprise space where a model works. Um, but the key things which you would see are feature engineering, data engineering, multiple algorithms, iterations, hyperparameter tuning, explaining, accuracy, loss, precision, recall. And once you train a model, you would see drift detection, malops, Q bias, things like that. But all of these things are things which we need to be concerned about. But if you look at the Gen AI era, the problems don't lessen in any means, but they do differ. The two important things which would stand out in the Gen AI era uh, is the prompt engineering, the foundation models. In today's discussion, my focus is going to be on the foundation models, the prompt engineering, uh, just because there are several key things to it and this, again, this technology is fastly evolving and on how it progresses. Uh, but this is, this is where we will start. Let's start with the foundation model. Again, I have the links here, and the links I've also shared with uh, the team so that you would have the links for you to you know, browse through. Uh, but let's start with the foundation model. We saw a large corpus of data being used to train the model. That is the first discussion which we had. There are several examples of foundation models, but this era started with attention is what you need, a Google paper, which focused on creating attention to every token. Google had to do this for enhancing their search capabilities to make it better and better. For example, if you recall years ago, you need to clearly specify um, if you want to say a restaurant recommendation. I, I used to do it reference and a zip code, like, you know, the 060074, things like that. Whereas uh, then it became reference um, near me. Then now I should just do restaurant recommendations. Then it clearly identifies that I'm near me and then do it. This progression has come because of the research they have been spending on the space. The tasks here, and you see in the right-hand corner, Outline the very use cases you see in the enterprise today. And uh, that this, these are well performed with the foundation models. Taking it one step further, what are the examples of foundation models? As you can see, there are several different companies evolving their journey in LLM world. Um, the most popular one you might recognize is BERT and GP, GPT-3. Which, which has been in existence since the later part of 2020. The chat GPT announced in November 2022 is essentially a chat interface and an API with application program interface call to the model with the prompt as your input. So this is the foundation model's evolution. And most of the time, you're interacting with the foundation models to retrieve the answer you need. That's, ex that's essentially what you're doing today. But we will see a little bit of how you would do it better. This is one of the popular tweets around the time when this topic was becoming you know, much into visibility of the world of tomorrow is going to be English. Um, and English as a programming language has been in research for a long time. The reality is starting to frame up with what we call as prompts. So let's 
see what is prompt. A prompt is a, just an English sentence, the natural language input um, driven across an LLM model, which is the foundational model to generate the output. Prompt engineering is again a relatively new discipline. The life of this field exists. Um, how fast the technology can make it obsolete. So this might or might not exist a few years from now. So before I, I, I go, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to walk you through some of the prompting and the prompting techniques. If you have a favorite, um, favorite uh, NLM model that you use, please go ahead there. And I'm going to just do a simple uh, you know, prompting techniques. Um, in this case, if you have bar, chat, GPT, whatever is your um, cup of tea, go ahead. And type in create an itinerary for family of three. This is just a simple prompting, no issues, like it's just one prompt. And if you have done that, is there any, anyone else which is going to respond to who have done that? Um, <laughs> English so close. Um, yes, it, it might be English or any other language. As of now, I just don't know of English. Um, but if anyone has tried that, you would see that um, you would see that the results were U.S. based mostly, and you probably got a New York, San Francisco, or some recommendation depending on which platform you have. But let's do one step further. In this instance, I'm going to give a context to it. Like, I'm going to change it. I'm in India, create an itinerary for a family of three. And in this instance, when you see it, um, your answer is probably going to change. Um, and this answer is probably going to be um, yeah, there's no engineering of prompting here. I'm just trying to get into the natural language text context. So when you do this, then it becomes context prompting. So you are giving a context, I'm in India, you create an itinerary for me. So when I do the second one, so this is when a little bit of role prompting and some of the enterprises you would see in the future would start using is you are a sales representative uh, for Southwest Airlines, uh, and you are helping a customer design um, a journey for uh, uh, for the customer. And it's the same statement, create an itinerary for fa family of three. But in this case, you have created a role for that customer, sorry, role for yourself, and then you are asking the itinerary to create. And if you see in here, in this instance, it will be, the answer would be to places where Southwest Airlines fly. That is where the answers would be. You can see how prompting can be a powerful tool and needs careful understanding on an enterprise or customer use, consumer use cases. So most likely, this kind of things are just the basics. As we, you know, as we interact, even as a consumer, we probably would get more familiarized with this in our day-to-day -day lives. You might be going to a retail a website, and you might be using some of these techniques to make sure it's customized for you as of now. But in the future, there might come to a point that you don't have to do this and it automatically do it for you. Let me take you through one step further with respect to short prompting, as what they call. They, it's the same before, but here, we, what is what we are trying to say? Zero shot prompting is then you give no context. Just asking them, hey, add two plus two, and you probably would get an answer four. And to, this morning I got a let by bar. Like you should know this kind of thing. Um, but zero shot prompting. But maybe you give an example and then ask the answer. And this is when I got all that. Three plus three equals six, and then. Um, Plus two. In that case, you get one shot prompting, which is one example, and then you're asking it to prompt. 
and it could be two. It can go on one, two, and short prompting. In this case, there are two examples, and then you are creating an example output. That's one. But there are new concepts which are evolving. The, you might have seen some of these chain of thought prompting, generated knowledge prompting, self consistency prompting, things like that. I do have references to some of the links which you would see more about these. Um, but the thing to remember here is um, if you want to solve a task, you give examples or you understand how it gets resolved so that you'd be able to uh, use it in the future. The thing which is evolving these days recently, I'm sure you have uh, seen it, the trendier one, is parameter efficient prompt tuning. Um, which adds the domain knowledge to the existing LLM model or foundational model you're using to create more into it, more insights into it. So with that, before we go to how I've seen enterprises start knowing it, because this is just a peek of what foundational models are and what's an LLM, let's see if there is any questions. I saw some questions coming up. Uh, King Zainab, I responded. Deterministic, it's probabilistic and deterministic. Um, deterministic is the one which we have in general. Um, so there are some links. Okay, and role prompting seems to focus. Job to be done, yes. And role prompting is just one thing. Uh, as you see evolve, you probably would get the enterprises would probably start thinking more and more with respect to how do I service my customers in the best way without even having to be able to do role prompting. Um, and uh, then I go to Q&A. Let me see. Um, is heavy data and um, LLM the same? Uh, I don't know what you mean by heavy data. Srinath, can you reach out to me offline, maybe? Um, because I don't know what heavy data means in this context. And how to tune pre-trained GPT or foundational models with custom data. Yes. And um, Hari Prasad, and that's the one which I talked to you about, parameter efficient tuning. Um, in the resources link, which they will share, I will add that link to you, which discusses a little bit more about that. Uh, this is um, enterprises more and more want to do that because they know the value they have with the data, uh, which doesn't exist today. So that is why it is uh, it is becoming more and more clear with enterprise uh, use cases. Yes. Um, okay. The, the prompting engineering itself is a whole field these days. Um, but I am at the I am at the belief that there would come a point where prompt engineering is not would not be needed at all. Um, there are a couple of concepts where they use algorithms to create prompt, or they use prompts to give samples and then create it. But this is a whole topic for us to uncover. Um, but in this session, the context is to make sure we understand that for the building block of um, Building block of uh, L, uh, for generative AI, you would think foundational models and prompt being one, but the field is growing rapidly. What's the point of short prompting? The point of short prompting is you give examples so that it starts thinking that way. Um, because most, like the simple example I showed here, it would work anyway because it does solve the, the problem. But for complicated, like, Example, right? We, I was trying to solve the geometry question for my daughter, who's a teenager, and the answer was incorrect. Um, and that's why there are concepts like chain of thought prompting, which comes into picture where it explains why it made that decision. But this kind of examples, hey, this is the way to solve it. Can you tell me now? Or this is similar to the way to look at it. Can you tell me now? Sets the context of doing it. Uh, it adds more context. Yes, that is true. Um, so when I especially you guys want to get the goals, 
the antiquity is sometimes bad at multiplication. Yes, that is that is true. I have seen that happen. But again, um, in my in my opinion, these things would evolve as it gets trained on. Uh, chat GPT is chat, not math GPT. And there is a math GPT. I forgot the name of it. Uh, created by math works, I think. Um, there is a specific uh, algebraic uh, kind of uh, math GPT which exists. GPT four behaves so different. Yes, it is far. It has definitely for sure changed. What is Wolfram? Um, any insights on how to create personalized models? Yes. Um, so that is personalized models by for enterprises or personalized models for yourself. Oh, Wolfram as Mathematica. I don't know. That doesn't ring a bell. There was probably a different uh, end. Um, but thank you to Suresh. Um, for the personalized models for yourself, the way I would do it is through the parameter efficient tuning. If you have your own specific data that's different, which doesn't exist in LLM, and it's unique to yourself, um, then you need to bring that data and tune the model so that it first understands the global context and then it understands the current context. Um, but for if you are looking for examples, there are some hugging phase demos um, which are available. Please uh, reach out to me. I sh probably should find something. I'll, I'll share that with you. Abhijit, so is foundational model converted into LLM? Uh, for, for language purposes, foundation model is LLM. That's the like it adds more context to it when you add domains, but that's the basic context to it. Um, yeah, I think I answered all of these questions. Do we have any apps or websites where I can plug in my data and create my own search quickly? Um, that is, um, I haven't seen one which which does that. But there are some Google products. Uh, if you are um, right now at 12.30 EST, um, there is um, the Google events happening. So we don't know what's coming out there. So maybe you should look it up and see what's in the sales at 12.30 from the Google I.O. Uh, how Langchain can help this area? Yeah. So Langchain is an area where it creates the chaining of some of these models, instead of using one model, you're using multiple models based on the need, or you know, you create the embedding of a vector and then bring all of those together. Um, but the area of what the questions are coming, which is essentially creating a personalized model, um, that might or might not help. It, you don't need that to solve the uh, problem. GPT-4 API to create with the data, GPT-4 is a foundational model, and it will work very well for the foundational model. For you to plug in your data, then you're creating your own prompt tuning to access it. It's not a search engine. Yes. Okay. So, since the uh, who, um, would you see smaller open source LLM models pre-trained? With open source high quality data set and fine tune with own parameters, so we can run our own. Be as good as no. Um, I so depending on the task, so you don't need to know the Taylor Swift lyrics for the mod for some of the enterprise models, which which is personally needed. So you probably in your organization you could create a smaller model, and I think that's the whole concept when um, the Bloomberg GPT and all of the rest of the you know, industries creating their own GPT are coming up with. Um, so I wouldn't say the larger size of the model, the accurate it is, but it also depends on the context of what that use case is, because some of it is irrelevant and some of it might be needed. And for example, in one of the use cases, uh, is uh, in one of the use cases for a customer, they are looking to look at territory level sales details. And if you're looking at the territory level sales details, the context of it lies within your organization and that makes sense. But 
maybe there are some relevant details about the territory or about the region or something like that, which you might need to reference a large language model. So that's why it's different. Is GPT-4 API public or open source? It is, from my understanding, it's not open source, and that's the differentiator between the GPT-3 and GPT-4. So let me do the enterprise landscape because this is the last section, and it's going to be very quick. But this is based on the experiences I have seen in the area, so it's, it will be slightly you know, less technical, uh, but um, more with respect to what we are seeing in the industry, how we are proceeding with this. Um, if you haven't seen this before, this is a great article from Sequoia uh, who has talked about how uh, the future of some of these application landscape would look like. Um, and the sales and marketing continues to dominate for now uh, because the initial adoption will be there as it re creates content, as it creates email, things like that. Uh, but slowly we'll see progress in the rest of the spaces. But this is the most important slide, and I'm sure you have seen all of this with the pet pitfalls in the industry. Um, but hallucination, this has been a widely discussed topic. Um, the reason behind, we probably know because it's an autocomplete, essentially. It's probabilistic in nature, and that's why it hallucinates. Um, one way to make it useful, it'd be to process, like using prompt, right? Answer the question as truthfully as possible. And if you're unsure, just say, sorry, I don't know. Then maybe it will say, sorry, I don't know. And copyright has been a concern, and uh, countries are taking different, different approaches. Um, if you have seen the news, you would have seen approaches from China, from EU, from USA, from India, everywhere. I think over the course of years, you would see a slew of lawsuits before we understand, and it's okay to train the model. Um, and we, we would know um, well, whose copyright this is and how it's generating. Bias, and this is my most concerning thing, um, which is uh, the internet is full of biased content. We know that. Training against those data invariably will lead to biased results. Um, though companies struggle to create responsible AI practices, and Microsoft and Google have been very open about this, um, there still is a very high chance of uh, bias result. So that's something which we should be concerned about. Prompt injection is, has been up and coming, but there are some ways to avoid it. Uh, prompt injection is the process of hijacking the language model output. Um, it, it allows the hacker to get the model to say anything they want. That can occur when you have untrusted text as part of the prompt. And the people compare this with the Oracle you know, injection, um, the DB database injection. So next slide. Most organizations I work with, I'm seeing this continuously. It is they want to implement a Gen AI, but they want to safeguard their data. They are very, and they want to create some enterprise process, which is a kind of DevOps, MLOps, AI ops together. Um, and they're also plan, they, the planning this is hazardous because it's ever changing. So they are trying to look at it from a perspective of how do I turn this hype to, to a reality to make it work? Um, but there are companies who are adapting like you have seen, you know, tools such as Stack Overflow, Jira, Salesforce, uh, Khan Academy, things like that, which are coming. So I feel like there is a lot which is there, uh, but there are older organizations tend to be um, very cautious in the space. This is, there's a lot of players in the space. I'm not going to add all of those. Um, but I wanted to provide a list, so if you are following, I think these are the companies you should definitely follow. Um, uh, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, Hugging Face, Databricks, Cohere, OpenAI, uh, Anthropic, and AI21 Labs. But if there is a clear winner, it's probably um, NVIDIA, in my opinion, because of the compute resources. Uh, send the resources, and the team would send it back to you, but uh, I think uh, that would be um, a good set of starting point. There are some couple of new courses which are available. Uh, it just takes time, but you would have it. Um, 
this is a new topic for me. I like because everything is new. Uh, the content is new. I would love your feedback. If you could take a couple of minutes, um, scan the feedback form. Um, maybe you could post the feedback link here as well. As I answer the question, if you could take a couple of minutes, it's three questions. I would love to you know, hear what you're thinking um, and so that we can refine the content, add more things, things like that. It will be more helpful for me. So let me go to questions. Um, if, um, old from sense, I have to look it up. I honestly didn't know. Can you elaborate more on hallucination pitfalls? Because these LLMs are very probabilistic in nature, sometimes when it doesn't know, it just starts spitting out things because it's just predicting the next word and what it could be. And that's why hallucination occurs because it doesn't, it's not really thinking and reacting. The similar, uh, the way I explained about writing a story, it's not thinking and responding, it's more predicting the next word. So the chances of hallucination are more. Wolfram launched a book talking about his experience with ChatGPT. I need to look it up, Wolfram. I have not seen that before. But the one which I talked to you about was some kind of... What about rivalries in the space, like between Tesla, Elon, and Sam, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Google, etc.? I think everyone is trying to find their place. I honestly don't know. I'm more of an enthusiast. So wherever technology takes us, I think we're taking. Um, but it's an evolving field. Now we have thousands of, yes, there is a lot of entrance in the area. What is ChatGPT doing? Why does it work? That's a good recommendation. If you get a chance, can you show the resources slide again, please? Sure. I, actually, they're going to be sending it out um, as well. So you should have it uh, from them. Do technologists and LLM AI experts think about pitfalls and the impact before they have um, I don't know. I think um, the responsible AI practices in each of those companies should have them indicating that they need to be thinking in that perspective. Um, but I honestly haven't seen much of it, at least since this since the chat GPT craze has come. Um, but there is a lot for us to definitely think about. Um, I'm glad we're all thinking about this because that's an important uh, ethics practice we need to instill and question often because that's worrisome. Um, so the, can you post the feedback link? Do you have any info about recent code hearings? From, I, have, I have no idea, but I do follow some of those you know, YouTube videos, but no idea what the code hearing is. I also have not heard of this court hearing, um, <laughs> but I'm definitely going to look it up. Uh, so if you, could, <laughs> <laughs> if you could take a few minutes, enter your feedback, I would really appreciate it. There are 57 of you. I would really appreciate to see it. Um, like to be part of it. Okay. Feedback done. Google I.O. I don't know. I am excited to see as well. I'm like, oh, it's the same day. I'm, I'm right after this call. I'm jumping into the call because I have no idea about more and not just bad. Hopefully, I am. I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to it. Is that what you're referring to? I don't know. Okay. Um. So, is there any? There's a Q and A. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the next big shift with Gen AI moving so fast? I think. Um, the one thing which I feel uh, the next big shift is um, in enterprise space, at least, because that's what I'm most excited about, is the, know that enterprises are going wild. They are going to come up with their own models. And that model, will it be open source or how will we access it? What is the kind of consumer experience we are going to change? Um, is what I, I think is going to be the next big shift. Um, but because that's where I am seeing the most um, interaction for sure. That's that's where I think it'll be. Uh, feedback, Apple will be creating, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think, I don't think they will call it as GPT, maybe something else. Um, it is related with the, 
Uh, see that's a thank, like the slides and explanations. Thank you. But um, if I love to talk to you. Um, so LLM and MLM, I did talk about it a little bit. I have not dealt with MLM a lot, but it's mass language modeling, essentially like a fill in the blanks versus the LLM. But I would look it up and then I myself would need to get educated. What are some of the new job roles that are going to get created in your opinion? Um, the thing which is a phrase is that prompt engineering field, but I don't know if that would even survive. That's my, my opinion. I think it is going to be more, um, how would you be able to integrate this, create your own uh, model is where I think um, it will evolve. I don't know if it's a new job role. It's more like we would need more of the expertise in this field. How do you test the model properly? The model might provide wrong answers. Yes, it does. A very, um, so much that, that is, um, I have faced that. I've been testing it out for the past couple of months, and uh, it does give you the wrong answer very confidently. Um, and it does give you the wrong answer confidently multiple times in multiple executions in multiple different ways. And uh, those are kind of the things which we need to be worried about. Again, it is a fancy autocomplete end of the day. And that's something which we need to remember. It is probabilistic. It is not meant to uh, create anything which is new. Um, we just need to know how to handle it and use for the use cases which are important. Don't use it like I had a friend who did um, medical prescription analysis. That is probably wrong. Uh, but you could ask it to narrate something and it probably will very clearly. How do you see the LLM ops space evolving and keeping this? I think that's a good space, uh, Munis. Uh, which we will continue to see that evolve. Uh, LLM ops or someone had called something else. Forgetting the name, but that is also with respect to how that ops situation would evolve. We will see, um, if you would appreciate seeing this. Sure, um, we can share the resources, but these are you know good resources for you to look at. Uh, Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I'm going to love seeing the feedback. Um, and can you speak to other forms of Gen AI beyond? Um, yeah. A Bing Googling could lend us. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Thank you okay. very much. I appreciate your time. <laughs>